It's a great pleasure to host a webinar together with Dr. Lauren Stratsky and the ACC Imaging Council on a very interesting topic, which is the multimodality imaging of anomalous coronary artery. So in our panel today, we have Dr. Mohamed Soheib Nazir, author of the case that he will present an excellent case for us. Dr. Rebecca Preston, Director of Cardiac CT, Professor Amadeo Kiribiri, Clinical Lead for CMR, Dr. Nabil Sheikh, Consultant in Inherited Cardiac Conditions, and the authors are affiliated with Kaizen St. Thomas's NHS Trust and King's College London. Also in our panel, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nancy Poire, a Professor of Surgery at the Université de Montréal and Chief of Cardiac Surgery at uh, Saint Justine, Dr. David Fishman, Professor of Cardiology at Thomas Jefferson University, and Dr. Jordan Strom, Assistant Professor at Harvard University and Cardiologist at Beth Israel Diaconis Medical Center and Harvard Medical. So we will start with the presentation of the case, and then Dr. Jordan Strom will present the broad spectrum of multimodality imaging when an anomalous origin of a coronary artery is incidentally found from anatomy and course to deciding if a functional test is needed and how to best demonstrate ischemia. And uh, just a note on behalf of me and Dr. Ratsky that please submit any questions to in the chat box and we will get the, uh, the questions answered and addressed by our expert panel. So thank you so much. I would like to give the word to Dr. Suhaib, uh, Suhaib Nazir, who will start with the presentation of the case. Thank you. First of all, on behalf of the co-authors and myself, um, very many thanks for kindly inviting us for this webinar to be able to present and discuss the case with you all collectively. So um, I'm going to go straight into this case. Um, we had a 25-year-old um, gentleman who was African ethnicity who was referred to our specialist heart centre following episodes of chest pains and blackouts. In fact, he was previously seen elsewhere in another hospital and he had a series of investigations which included a transthoracic echocardiogram and a 24 hour halter recording, which are both reported as normal. And, and as a result, he was discharged from follow up. He continued to have uh, symptoms and in fact, he had a two year history of exertional chest pain, dizziness and presyncope while playing soccer, running on the flat or when he was exerting himself on the incline. Worryingly, um, he had actually suffered um, from syncope followed by, uh, uh, preceded by chest pain when he was playing soccer. So that's his main uh, symptoms. Um, just going a bit more about his background, he has no significant past medical history. His mother had hypertension and there was no family history of sudden cardiac death. There was no history of recreational or drug use uh, and he had an unremarkable clinical examination. Um, he was normal intensive and he had a, a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. Just show you his 12 lead EKG, which demonstrates sinus rhythm, normal axis, um, and as you can see by criteria, there's left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, not to shake, I'm not sure if you want to comment on the findings of uh, this left ventricular hypertrophy in, in a black athletic uh, patient. Yeah, so this pattern is pretty common and, and pretty normal for somebody of this chap's uh, age and ethnicity. Isolated voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy correlate pretty poorly with actual LVH in this group, particularly in young athletic individuals. But apart from the voltage criteria for LVH, there, there's some early repolarization, which again is a common finding in young athletes and, and something that we wouldn't take further if the athlete was completely asymptomatic and had no family history of note. So thank you. So in light of his history and um, unremarkable examination, he underwent a cardiovascular magnetic resonance examination uh, uh, scan. And uh, for this part, I'm now going to hand over to our Professor Kiribiri, who's going to talk you through some of the images that we acquired. Thank you, Sahib. So in, in this case, the patient was referred to assess cardiac function and structure. Um, so we have acquired a full set of uh, scene images and then a lake adolinum enhancement. Uh, on the screens, you have the uh, white blood uh, images with uh, short axis CNEs, uh, full coverage of the left ventricle, uh, 
uh, what we normally report on these scans is on the size of the ventricle, which in, the, in this case was normal in volume, uh, on the ejection fraction, which in this case was measured at 57%, and on the presence of regional wall motion abnormalities. Now, um, I'd like to move to the next slide, so we focus on the mid-ventricular uh, CINI uh, image. Um, and I'd like you to focus your attention on the thickening of the wall. Um, and uh, now if you concentrate your attention on the inferior wall, uh, you'll probably notice, even though there are not too many frames broadcasted at the moment, that uh, there is a regional wall motion here. So we have a very mild area of hypokinesia in the inferior wall. Uh, which luckily was spotted by the uh, operator which was reporting the scan. Um, and, um, and therefore, there was a question whether uh, there was, you know, what was causing this regional wall motion, whether there was any area of scar. So we can move to the next slide, which represents the acquisition of legatum enhancement. So uh, by routine in our center, we perform acquisition of legatum enhancement using uh, standard PSIR imaging. Uh, and these are the images shown on the slide in, at this moment, um, where um, there is no clear evidence uh, of the presence of late enhancement in this case. So if you focus your attention on the inferior wall, inferior and inferior septal, uh, the subendocardial layer and margin is a bit irregular. Uh, should always be expected to be much smoother than that, but there isn't real enhancement. Uh, however, given the presence of original wall motion abnormality, uh, we've also acquired uh, images uh, with a dark blood technique, uh, which, uh, which means a technique where the signal of blood is suppressed uh, below the level of the signal of scar in order to make easier to identify areas of very thin and sudden endocardial scar. And by doing so, um, and that's identified by the red arrow uh, on the image, we were able to identify the presence of a very thin rim of subendocardial scar in correspondence with uh, the area of regional wall motion abnormality. Now, we know that subendocardial scars are ischemic in origin, um, and therefore, we, uh, you know, that's how we reported it, uh, expecting, you know, some involvement of the coronary arteries in, in the uh, etiopathogenesis of uh, this abnormality. Thank you, Professor Kiribiri. Now, in light of those findings from the cardiac MRI, uh, this patient then underwent um, a CT coronary angiogram to assess for any coronary artery disease. And the technique we used was a prospective ECG gated CT coronary angiogram with um, contrast. And I'm just now going to hand over to Dr. Preston, who's going to uh, comment on the findings. So the first picture we have here is just a volume rendered reconstructed image showing a normal course of the LAD diagonal branches and you can just see the circumflex towards the back right of the image and part of the right coronary artery proximally towards the back left of the image. Um, and uh, the uh, picture on the right is an axial reconstructed image um, uh, through just above the aortic root, you can see the normal large left main stem and large proximal LAD, totally normal. And then at about the two o'clock position, you can see the anomalous origin of the right coronary artery. So it, it's pretty clear here that at the ostium, there's, you basically it's pinched and, and tight. Um, the proximal one centimetre of the right coronary artery looks narrowed. And you get the impression that this has probably got an intramural course because around the proximal right coronary artery, between about the one o'clock to the two o'clock position, you've got increased density tissue um, rather than just normal fat that you'd see around the aortic root. And then you see the right coronary artery uh, further along the proximal segment. Um, having a larger caliber. And then there's a little gap here where you don't see the coronary because it's just a bit tortuous. And then you see the normal size of the right coronary artery there with the arrow between the atrium and the right ventricle. So this looks like um, an intra-arterial course of the right coronary artery from the left coronary cusp with clear compression on the CT. Uh, these are required in end diastole, particularly tight at the ostium. Yeah, next slide. Uh, so this shows the same thing again. This is a MIPT image, so it's slightly thicker, and it means that you see bits of the coronary artery 
uh, or they say it looks like it's all in one line, although actually the artery may be going up and down a little bit. And it demonstrates very nicely the narrowed proximal course, which appears in an intramural um, a pattern. Yeah, next slide. Uh, and these are just some pictures. I find this helpful with anomalous coronaries because, of course, this is not a dynamic image. It's a static image acquisition, usually in end diastole. Um, and so uh, to try and suggest that there's compression can be difficult where cases are more subtle than this. But you see in the first image, which is labelled proximal RCA, where the arrow is, that's the ostium and very proximal uh, origin of the enormous right, right coronary artery, where it is clearly a kind of oval shape and very, very compressed. Uh, the middle image uh, shows us that this degree of compression goes on for about 10 millimetres, and then the proximal right coronary then has a normal size. And the image on the far right was is a true orthogonal cut through um, just after that one centimetre proximal vessel to show that the vessel is now a normal round configuration. So I find the change from the, the suspicious oval shape suggesting compression to the normal fat round shape of the coronary artery in the orthogonal cut through very helpful when you're looking to try and decide if there is uh, compression, uh, extrinsic compression of the vessel. And I think that's all the CT, is that right? Yeah, so this is just a volume rendered image, which can be sometimes helpful at surgery. Uh, on the right, and again, another sort of MIP image, uh, which is a maximum intensity projection. So it helps just to see the vessel sort of overlaid all in one axial slice. And again, I think that image on the right is helpful to suggest that, that this has got an intramural course, which can be useful for surgical. If we decide to go ahead with surgery, it's useful for surgical planning. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Preston. Um, so, in light of these findings, uh, the diagnosis was this patient had an anomalous right coronary artery arising from the left coronary sinus with an interarterial course, uh, with an intramural course, and an acute takeoff angle. And the MRI also helped to confirm the malignant nature of it because there was evidence of um, subendocardial infarction um, as a result of this disease. Um, so, for actually, that same day when we scanned the patient, I had an urgent discussion with the ICC Inherited Cardiac Conditions Consultant, Dr. Sheikh, um, who um, did, did a quick consult with me and we advised the patient to stop exercising and referred him urgently for uh, a referral by the cardi cardiothoracic surgeons. He underwent um, surgical correction of the anomalous right coronary artery by unroofing. In, in brief, it was the right coronary artery was cannulated. The mural portion of the right coronary artery was resected until it rose from the right coronary sinus and tacked back. Um, I'm really pleased to report that actually his surgery went well. Uh, and at follow up at six months, he's been doing quite well and is completely asymptomatic. And just to give some objective evidence on that, he had underwent an exercise treadmill test, which was satisfactory without any symptoms or ECG changes. So, a good result for the patient in the end. Um, so, that is the case summary. Um, just um, thank uh, and thank you on behalf of all co authors, thank you for listening for this aspect. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I will move, I will give the word to Dr. Lawrence Ratsky. Thank you. Uh, so, we heard a great case of a symptomatic individual who, despite having some initial or, uh, exams that most people would do, being the echo, the ECG, uh, and, uh, and the Holter. Um, because of the clinical suspicion, the team above went quite a bit further and, and used the advanced imaging to prove and ultimately guide therapy. Uh, most of the time, our patients are not symptomatic and, and we're, we're, we send a patient for a coronary angiography and we have an incidental finding of an anomalous coronary origin. So, Dr. Jordan Strom is going to give us a talk on how to evaluate the incidental finding of the anomalous coronary. Go ahead, Jordan. Thank you, Dr. Ratsky. In, in Thank you, um, everybody, for coming here and for the, the panel for having me. It's an excellent case and great opportunity. Uh, my name is Jordan Strom. I'm um, a non-invasive cardiologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School in, in Boston. Um, so, as um, Dr. Rutsky mentioned, um, uh, this is a frequently asymptomatic uh, uh, um, presentation identified incidentally with the other uh, forms of imaging. 
anomalous origin of the coronary artery from the opposite sinus of Valsalva, or ACAOS as it's abbreviated, occurs in about 1% of the general population, with the presentation more common uh, in uh, right coronary arteries originating from the left uh, cor uh, coronary sinus versus the, the, the converse. Um, it can present with chest pain, syncope, arrhythmia, or, or in, in some cases, sudden cardiac death or aborted sudden cardiac uh, death uh, up front. But, but again, this is most frequently an incidental finding. So how do you deal with, with these incidental findings and what imaging modalities are really necessary to, to, um, to work this up? So really, there are two sort of main goals for imaging. One is, is to define the coronary anatomy, the, the uh, uh, myocardium that's subtended by um, the, the coronary artery. Of course, there's a lot of variability in that. And then also to identify high-risk features that might suggest some uh, interarterial uh, course or compression. And then the second is to really define the functional significance of the anomaly and whether or not it's causing ischemia um, and, and potentially leading to uh, myocardial fracture, as it did in, in this particular case. So uh, in terms of the first part of this, um, there are a number of different courses that um, uh, may be taken by the uh, anomalous coronary arteries. Um, and this is just sort of uh, giving a, a schematic here on the left. And there are a number that are, are less concerning in the interarterial course, uh, which is third from the top here is, is the one that was presented here was the most concerning. Um, but you can have a, a subpulmonic course, which is um, also called an interoceptal course, which is uh, a course of the coronary between the RVOT. Um, and aorta. You can have a prepulmonic course, which is anterior to the pulmonary uh, artery. Um, uh, the the interarterial course, uh, which which is high risk, and we'll come back to to that. Um, and then there's the retroaortic course, which is where the the course of the coronary is between the left atrium and behind the uh, aorta. Um, so um, if you see, however, one of those interarterial courses that is high risk, and there are some other features that suggest an increased risk. Um, that being a, a slit like ostium. Um, um, compared to the normal coronary, um, an intramural course. So, in in the case where it, the course of the vessel uh, goes through the tunica media of the aortic wall, that's called an intramural course and is associated with an increased risk as well. Um, if there's an acute take takeoff angle, so if the proximal part of the coronary artery takes off at a less than 45 degree angle um, with a tangential course, then that is, is suggestive of an increased risk. And then if there's proximal narrowing or, or ellipticity, as we saw in this particular case, with greater than 50% narrowing of cross-sectional vessel area compared to the distal part, uh, an elliptical vessel shape um, with, with segmental hypoplasia. And I, I should just go to say that in, in studies that have looked at this, uh, another anatomic feature that is of risk is, is if it's the left coronary artery originating from the right coronary sinus, that's actually associated with a significantly higher risk of 20-year of, um, cumulative sudden cardiac death risk, about 6.3% versus 0.2%. So um, make, makes a difference in terms of which artery um, is, is anomalous in, in this case. There are also a number of high-risk functional and patient features. So if the patient's sent for a stress test and you find areas of uh, ischemia under stress conditions uh, in areas that are perfused by the anomalous vessel, and that, that, that last part is, is important because you can have uh, significant coronary disease. In fact, the, the most common cause of stress perfusion abnormalities in this case is actually not with a culprit artery, uh, but but other uh, pre-existing coronary disease. But if it is in, in the areas attended by the vessel, then that is of concern. Um, and, and similarly here, uh, and I think this case wonderfully uh, shows the be benefit of using CMR in this population, is that um, bursts of myocardial ischemia over time can lead to myocardial fibrosis, which can be detectable um, via cardiac MRI imaging and, and is a substrate for lethal arrhythmias, ultimately. Uh, this is just another uh, feature I, I put on the list here, which is to say that um, in those who are younger at the uh, age of population, the risk seems to be higher than those who uh, are older at the age of presentation. And um, there's some debate uh, whether or not that's um, related to uh, individuals surviving to the point that they are able uh, to detect it later in life or, or if there's... Um, another component to this, but there's um, some um, degree of risk there. Now, in terms of the choice of imaging test, um, if this is not, not meant to be a, a slide that or a, a diagram that um, uh, we'll go over in, in complete depth, but just to say that there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages to the various imaging modalities. So echocardiography is actually very useful, and particularly transthoracic echo is useful in children where you're able to visualize the course of the proximal vessels. TEE in adults can increase the sensitivity compared to transthoracics. Um, 
there are published reports suggesting that there's an accuracy of about 92.5% in some series for identifying an intramural course. But of course, uh, with, with ECHO, there's a high interior observer variability and it depends on the, the quality of the images that are ultimately acquired. And so what are some of the other techniques? Uh, well, I think CTA is, is sort of a no-brainer here. This is really the first uh, line modality due to the high spatial resolution, the uh, ability to be able to do these double oblique reformats to be able to identify high-risk features. The main disadvantage, there are very few, uh, but is the presence of ionizing radiation, though with appropriate um, prospective gating, et cetera, uh, you're able to keep the, the, uh, the ionizing, the rate of radiation pretty low. Um, and then SPECT or PET, um, uh, if you if you screen people uh, with anomalous coronaries uh, with a spec or PEC, you'll find ischemia, depending on the study that you look at, in anywhere from 33 to 80% of cases. Um, the PET and SPECT give you the option of potentially combining that with CTA or, or cardiac MRI to get better imaging, which is really uh, uniquely um, advantageous. Um, the disadvantage, as I mentioned, is that ischemia in this setting could also be due to, due to concomitant coronary disease, particularly in older um, patients. And uh, you can have normal perfusion uh, on, on SPECT or PET, but in fact, the, the, um, the, the coronary flow reserve may be impaired uh, despite that. So cardiac MRI, I think this is a, um, an image from this particular case shows the advantage of, of being able to use this dark blood technique and then identifying uh, the subendocardial scar. Um, has a, cardiac MRI has a lot of uh, potential advantages. Uh, it does have a high spatial resolution, though less so than, than um, coronary uh, CT, um, but it also gives a lot of information on ventricular function and scar. And, and in this particular case, by, by blunting the signal uh, from the, the blood pool with dark blood imaging, you're able to really be able to create that contrast with the blood pool and the subendocardium. And, and this would otherwise be, as you can see in the traditional imaging, it's, it's very hard to spot and maybe miss um, unless you use this particular um, uh, technique. Um, there's no ionizing radiation, so this is the technique of choice, I think, in evaluating um, children up front, um, and, um, and can be paired with exercise or dobutamine to identify whether or not there's a functional abnormality to the underlying significance. Um, gadolinium contrast um, and special imaging protocols can improve the resolution, so we frequently are able to identify the initial course um, and and uh, takeoff of the, the coronaries on a standard cardiac MRI, but if you want to get a little bit more detail into that and, and want really the best uh, imaging, both of the, the proximal vessels, but also the mid vessel. Um, there are a number of different sort of in, in, uh, techniques that you can use, things like respiratory gating, compressed sensing, that can ultimately improve the resolution um, and the ability to be able to detect um, coronary anomalies. Um, the disadvantages are, are ultimately that it, it does tend to be a little bit less consistent um, from center to center than than CTA, um, and like I mentioned earlier, it can be difficult to visualize the distal vessels. And so, um, that if that's of relevance in, in the case, then then CTA may be a complementary tool here. Um, and then I would be remiss we have uh, Dr. Fishman on the call if I didn't mention uh, invasive coronary angiography, and I know he'll talk more about that. But that um, is is very helpful and ultimately may help define uh, the not only the course of the anomalous vessel, but also the course of other coronary artery disease as well. Um, OCT in, in particular has some benefit because the spatial resolution is so low uh, or um, is so good, it may be help, helpful to assess the lumen geometry and see whether or not there's, com there's ultimately compression. IVIS is helpful, but the cross-sectional area may uh, prohibit some uh, measurements that the catheter itself is larger, and so that might be uh, prohibitive for uh, measurements during debutamine or exercise, particularly if you think that it's going to be a lot of systolic squeeze. So there are a number of pitfalls of functional testing. We really, uh, this is a, a largely um, uh, not data free, but data limited zone here um, in that uh, there in general is a low incidence of ischemia among symptomatic patients. And, and what do you do with a patient who's symptomatic but doesn't necessarily have ischemia documented on a functional test? There's also a thought that uh, the heart rate um, target that we use, 85% of the max protected heart rate, may be not appropriate for this population if we can generate a higher heart rate goal and maybe be able to see um, ischemia with, with, with a much higher, you need a higher heart rate to generate that. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, the, the choice of stress agent to use exercise, dibutamine, or, or, uh, which is more phys physiologic, or a vasodilator. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, because of the uh, coronary anomalies, you may also have a uh, wide variability in, in vascular distributions. And in fact, the, the standard AHA vascular 
distributions, um, the 17 segment model may not be applicable in this particular case. And the lastly is there's really not a lot of evidence base uh, to support the role of functional testing in guiding uh, subsequent therapy. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for having me and I'll turn it back over to the panel. Thanks, that was great. Um, so just to, to, this is actually the first question is gonna be addressed to the entire panel. Uh, historically, uh, before we vascularize, we try and avoid that oculus stenotic reflex and we want to prove ischemia, whether it's at the time, whether it's non-invasively or whether it's at the time of, of the invasive coronary angiogram uh, using different techniques, IFR, FFR, OCT, et cetera. Um, so this is really for everybody, uh, and you can jump in uh, as you wish. Uh, what are your, are your opinions? Because it's a very different disease, and as, as Jordi said, there's lack of evidence. What is your opinion in obtaining uh, some some evidence of, of ischemia prior to deciding to revascularize? So who wants to jump in first? I can make a comment from the cardiac MRI point of view. Uh, that's an excellent question. The, the problem is that uh, probably uh, ischemia has a different role depending on the type of abnormality we are looking at uh, and on the specific mechanism and anatomy of particularly of the vessels at the origin. Um, in cardiac MRI, the most commonly used stress is a vasodilatory stress. And it may well be that this kind of stress does not fully represent the type of, uh, you know, mechanics or causes that in vivo lead to a reduction of blood flow, uh, which might, in, might instead be compression of the vessel in the intramural course uh, or other mechanisms. Uh, we know for sure that if we have uh, an anomalous origin of the coronary arteries from the pulmonary artery, from, for instance, at least in my experience, in this type of uh, abnormalities, there is almost always a perfusion defect or alternatively a large subendocardial scar. Other types, uh, I'm not so sure. Um, and therefore, we do not routinely acquire these images just for the purpose of um, studying the anomalous coronary arteries. Uh, so, however, so some patients with chest pain could be referred, uh, you know, and have the perfusion because they're just being referred due to chest pain and then vetted to a stress perfusion protocol. So, so we saw a number of high risk features uh, and on MRI, you already have evidence, uh, documented evidence of damage potentially. Uh, what about the other panelists? If you, if you weren't, didn't have that MRI um, uh, and you had high risk features or not high risk features, would you want to, how would that help you decide whether you wanted to demonstrate a schema? For example, you didn't have high risk features. Anybody jump in? It, it, as you said, there's a lack of evidence, and I think this is a really challenging situation to really be in. But ultimately, I do see, you know, there may be uh, some benefit insofar as it's it's another uh, item on the list. And ultimately, we we, we can't think of th these each add uh, some degree of risk, um, and each high risk feature adds some degree of risk. And the more you have, the higher risk ultimately you have. And so I I would like to think of it as sort of cumulatively. And if we have tests in our in, in our uh, uh, bucket that allow us to be able to evaluate that, then it, it's reasonable to do so, though understanding that the lack of a schema doesn't necessarily imply low risk. So just before we go on to the next question, seeing as how you, across the street from you, you have this wonderful organization that loves coming up with risk scores. Uh, do you think there's a role to make a risk score for this? Oh, goodness. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, and, and certainly, you know, one could come up with a risk score. I think um, the challenges there are uh, that this is relatively infrequent and, and, and identifying, um, you, you sort of have to have a large enough data set to really know um, what is the underlying risk. And I think you'd ultimately have to phenotype a lot of different people as well to know, um, are we missing people who, who have sudden cardiac death and we don't attribute it necessarily to an anomalous coronary, coronary artery? So what is the true background risk I think can be really hard to discern and that makes creation of a risk score ultimately challenging. That's a great point. I'm going to come to a question that I just made up at the end uh, because it's a UK group, uh, but we're going to go ahead with the other questions. Um, Dr. Sheikh, uh, what are the implications of, of, the, of finding this in an athlete? And is there a role for screening for anomalous coronaries in athletes? Yeah, so um, uh, th thank you again for the question. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the implications in athletes are actually uh, 
quite significant. Remember that these individuals, particularly professional athletes, um, you know, they, this is their livelihood and they're doing something that is putting strain on the heart and uh, the chest wall moving, etc. Um, if I may share my screen, I have a few slides on this. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yes, now. Yeah, okay, great. So, um, as uh, Dr. Strom pointed out in his presentation, um, the prevalence of anomalous coronary arteries is only 1% in the general, general population. But actually, if we look at case series of athletes who've died suddenly, the prevalence is much higher. Um, it, in terms of symptoms, athletes will present in the usual way, so chest pain on exertion and exertional syncope. In my experience, exertional syncope is a really, really key red flag symptom. So we're talking about syncope that's occurring in the middle of exercise, not after the athlete has finished a, a session, but bang, you know, they're sprinting for the ball and they just go down. Um, that's um, that's the very sort of red flag symptom. It doesn't, of course, always mean that there's an anomalous coronary artery, but it could it could be a sign of uh, arrhythmia, etc. And unfortunately, again, as as has been pointed out before, sudden death may be the first manifestation of an anomalous coronary artery in athletes, simply because up to two thirds, according to some case series, are completely asymptomatic. Um, so. Looking at um, data from the US on athletes who've died suddenly, uh, this is um, data from Barry Marin's group published in 2009. They looked at an analysis of almost 2000 deaths in athletes over a 26 uh, year period. And out of the individuals where a cardiovascular event was definitely confirmed, we could see that anomalous coronary arteries make up 17% of the total deaths. This is another case series from the United States, this time from Kimberly Harmon's group. And again, we can see that anomalous coronary arteries um, uh, make up 11% of athletes who died suddenly. So these are findings obviously on, on post-mortem after death. And interestingly, this group also looked at what sort of characteristics there were for these athletes. And they found that in terms of anomalous coronary arteries, 86% died during or shortly after exertion. So the fact that they're doing intense exercise is actually also a risk factor here. Uh, moving across the pond, and this is some data from the United Kingdom. And actually this case series showed that the overall prevalence in this cohort of anomalous coronary arteries as a cause of death in athletes was only around 5%. However, this group did divide the data up into different age groups. And again, as Dr. Strom's uh, pointed out before, in those under the age of 18 years, anomalous coronary arteries appear to be a, a, a more important cause of sudden death than in older co cohorts, so the, the 18 to 35s and, and those above the age of 35 years. So it, we do have some evidence that it tends to uh, affect younger athletes more than older athletes. We've all seen this before. These are different sort of uh, orientations. And again, the post-mortem data from case series of athletes who've died suddenly sh show that in particular, um, uh, the left coronary artery coming from the right, uh, the commonest patterns observed in athletes who've died suddenly, again, um, sort of alluding to the fact that these are higher, higher risk, um, higher risk um, uh, uh, configurations. So what do we do about athletes who have uh, who are found to have an anomalous coronary artery? Well, there are guidelines to help us both in the United States and in the you know, uh, and and in in Europe. So starting with the European guidelines, these guidelines have sort of taken a general approach. So they talk about generally what you should do. So the first recommendation is that if we're considering sporting activities in an athlete with um, an anomalous coronary artery, imaging has to be have been done to identify high risk patterns. And they also recommend doing some kind of stress test. So here they've said exercise stress test to check for ischemia. Uh, 
Now, in completely asymptomatic individuals with anomalous coronary arteries that don't show any high risk features, so for example, those that don't course between the larger vessels, they don't have a slit like orifice. Um, the guidelines state that competition may be considered, but there's always the caveat after adequate counselling on the risks, provided that there is absence of inducible ischemia. So again, uh, some kind of a stress test is recommended, even if the athlete is asymptomatic. If the athlete um, goes on to have surgical repair, um, the guidelines state that uh, the earliest they should return to competitive sports is three months after surgery and only if they're asymptomatic and again only if a um, uh, some kind of functional test has shown uh, no evidence of inducible myocardial ischemia. And finally, um, if um, athletes don't have um, surgical correction but they do have high risk features then the guidelines say that most competitive sports um, should be prohibited really apart from those maybe with, with only mild intensity. So those are the European guidelines. Now, going on to the American guidelines, these are a, a bit more specific and they talk about different configurations of anomalous coronary arteries. So to start off with, athletes with a right coronary artery arising from the left sinus of Valsalva should be evaluated with an exercise stress test. And if the athlete has symptoms or a positive stress test, um, permission to compete can only be considered after adequate counselling. So those without symptoms, sorry, and without a positive stress test can uh, compete in competitive sports. But again, after being counselled that, for example, a negative stress test is not 100%. It may not always um, show ischemia in the in the lab or when we're doing it in, in our in our clinics. Um, the situation is, on the athletic playing field may be different. In non-operated athletes with uh, anomalous origin of the right coronary from the left sinus of Valsalva who have got symptoms, have shown ventricular arrhythmias or they have, they have signs of ischemia on a functional test, um, they should be restricted from participation in all competitive sports with the uh, exception of very, very low intensity sports until something is done to correct uh, the anomaly. Moving on to athletes with uh, anomalous origin from the left of the left coronary artery from the right sinus, especially when the artery passes between the primary artery and the aorta, the guidelines state that these individuals should be restricted from participation in all competitive sports with the exception of very, very mild intensity sports regardless of whether the athlete has symptoms or not. So even if this configuration is discovered incidentally and the athlete is completely asymptomatic, the guidelines say that they should be restricted from participation uh, until this is corrected. And in um, agreement with the, um, with the uh, European guidelines, again, um, after surgical repair, uh, they state that uh, three months should be um, Three, the three month point is after which re, uh, uh, re sort of engagement in competitive sports should be considered. Again, if the athlete is free of symptoms and an exercise, a functional test shows no evidence of ischemia. Now, as you can Nabil, see from the. Nabil, can you, Nabil, can you just summarize? Because we want to move on to other questions, please. Yep, of course. Um, I'll just end up uh, talking very quickly about screening. ECG is completely. Um, uh, useless for this because it won't show any changes, but echocardiography has been shown in some athletic cohorts uh, to be able to detect uh, the coronary artery ostea in up to 90% of athletes. So in those athletes who are going uh, echo, undergoing echocardiography, they should we should try and look at the ostea. Um, so here in this example, you can see the uh, origin of the left main stem, and in the same athlete you can see the origin of the right coronary artery. So although screening is not done routinely in those athletes who are undergoing echocardiography, an attempt should be made to identify the, the coronary ostea. So I'll finish here and hand back to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nabil. This is a great presentation, very thorough. Um, if it's okay, I will uh, move uh, to uh, Dr. Preston. Uh, Becky, we have a question for from the audience for about CT. First of all, I want to ask you why 
CT is uh, very good for the assessment of anomalous coronary arteries. And if you could also a short comment about the radiation doses for those that they don't use CT as often. And the question that we have from the from the audience is that um, a person says that a colleague says that it, she has some difficulty differentiating intraseptal versus interarterial course on CT. Is the origin relatively relative to the pulmonary valve plane the most important discriminator? Uh, often I often see the origin being just below the pulmonary valve, uh, pulmonic valve, and but the distal left main course is superiorly to above the pulmonic valve. Uh, if you can illustrate this or at least give us a, a direction on this. Sure. So to take the questions one by one, I think the first question about why is CT good for this, we covered very eloquently earlier on, and it's really just because it's got such great spatial resolution. Um, and so you can not only see any change in the caliber of the vessel, but you can see the surrounding structures that might be causing any extrinsic compression, and you can see uh, uh, any of the other more high risk features that that we've looked at before, like the the angle of takeoff or the slit like origin, um, uh, and those are you know. Even if you've got a fairly low quality scan, you can make an assessment about most of those things. Um, I'll come on to the assessment of the intraseptal versus intraarterial course in just a second to quickly cover the dose. Uh, yes, so we mentioned in one of the earlier slides that with the modern scanners, if you absolutely optimize everything, you can get a scan for about half a millisievert of radiation. Um, and uh, millisieverts of the way that we generally talk about radiation dose um, for those non radiologists amongst us, because they are um, a way that you can compare radiation across different modalities of scanning, different types of radiation source, and it takes into account organ weighting factors. So the organs that are in the direct or indirect line of whatever x-rays you're delivering and that's one of the reasons why ct has traditionally been a higher dose because the breasts are directly within the radiation field and so correspondingly the cath lab doses um, have less organ weighting sensitivity because the breasts are not directly in the radiation field so um, in summary, the radiation dose really depends on the size of the person, their heart rate, the sort of type of quality of scan that you're aiming for. But certainly we do a lot of paediatrics as well with anomalous coronary arteries. You always get imaging for a dose of less than one millisievert, and it's possible to do the same in adults. Um, just for those of you to put one millisievert of dose into perspective, that equates to a lifetime in increased cancer risk in adults of 0.04%. So that's so small, it's difficult to really understand, but our background radiation for a year in the UK is three to five millisieverts. When I did a quick Google online in the US, and someone could correct me, it's about six millisieverts. But obviously this varies depending on how much radon is in the rocks where you live. In Cornwall in England, it's six to eight millisieverts because there's radiation in the rocks. So it's about one millisievert, but if you're a very large person with a very high heart rate, you might get up to six millisieverts of dose. So it does depend on how you use your scanner. Uh, and um, the final thing to put that into perspective, the 0.004 percentage increased risk of uh, cancer in your adult lifetime, that's the one millisievert, also equates to you can do 20 transatlantic flights for 1.6 millisieverts. So, we don't think that much about flying. We probably will be quite excited to fly a bit more at the moment. Um, so the final uh, question was about differentiating uh, the course of whether the anomalous coronary artery is uh, uh, have interceptal or intramural course. And it is sometimes difficult. The interceptal course for me really um, you can see the artery going through the superior aspect of the interventricular septum. So it's surrounded by the muscle of the myocardium. So um, that's usually quite straightforward because you can just see it surrounded by 
uh, the superior septum because you get the increased density of the muscle all wrapped all the way around the, the uh, coronary artery. But I think it is sometimes very hard. I had a case yesterday, a 15 year old, um, who was getting clear exertional angina in the playground and still no one wants to operate her, even though uh, she has um, st uh, regional wall mo motion abnormalities on her stress echo, because I can't decide if that anomalous artery also uh, from the right coronary cusp, anomalous left mainstem, I can't decide if there's an uh, intramural course or not, and the surgeons won't operate if they don't think that we can clearly see an intramural course. So it's not very, I don't know if anyone else has got anything to add of the panel, but I, it can be very hard. Thank you, Dr. Preston. We're gonna to move to Dr. Fishman, who's our interventional cardiologist on, on the panel. Uh, as someone who is a non-invasive cardiologist, I've always admired how the interventionalists can figure out what the course of the anomalous coronary is by either putting catheters here or there or taking multiple projections. I can't just figure it out in my brain, but can you tell us what your tricks are? And also, there have been a number of questions from the audience in terms of using FFR, IFR, OCT, IVIS. When do you decide to use what? Well, thanks for being kind to me about being an angiographer and, and understanding the anatomy. You know, during coronary ang angiography, uh, it is of importance to avoid misdiagnosis uh, of an unsuspected anomalous coronary vessel. If a vessel is not visualized, we cannot assume it's occluded at the osteum. Um, unperfused myocardium must be accounted for in the uh, absence of a readily visualized uh, vessel. This can be challenging, even for the experienced angiographer. From an angiographer's perspective, uh, um, uh, anomalous vessels pose two problems, locating and then engaging the osteum and as well as defining the precise course of the artery. Um, with respect to locating the vessel, tips include non-selective uh, injection into the coronary cusp, looking for the origin of the vessel, as well as aortography and ventriculography, uh, focusing on the aortic root sign where a vessel appears to cross the aorta and pulmonary artery. I'm gonna share my slides if I can. Um, uh, selective in, uh, engagement of the anomalous vessel uh, can take some time. And I think uh, from an interventionalist or an angiographer uh, uh, perspective, we have to be willing to put that time in, as well as to be uh, familiar with non-catheters uh, we don't routinely use, like Amplatz catheters and multipurpose catheters. Um, and as challenging as that finding the vessel uh, 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 is, um, probably equally as challenging is understanding that course that it takes when we're looking at a planar angiography. In, uh, 2000, in 1990, Sirota uh, um, and colleagues defined this dot and uh, I method. Um, the anomalous right coronary artery, which arises from the left coronary sinus, runs intraarterially between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Uh, during angiography in a right oblique projection with its anterior directed course, the vessel will have this appearance of a dot. I will say, though, visualization of this is, you know, in, in, in pictures, what we show and in, 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 manuscripts or whatever, uh, they look clear, but it's really not that clear uh, when you're looking for that dot sign. Um, visualization, the same from the left main from the, uh, artery uh, arising from the right sign is equally as daunting, um, but poses more risks uh, because the only one in the four courses actually run intra-arterial, so you have to really get it right. Uh, here too, the dot nine method can be used during REO coronary angiography, the intra-arterial vessel is seen on end and to, to the order as a dot, uh, from the aorta. The benign course anterior of the pulmonary artery will also appear as a dot um, in the REO projection. And so there's the thought of uh, the use of the pulmonary catheter has been described uh, to help demarcate the pulmonary artery, uh, but this really remains with limitations and many inaccuracies. So most of us are not doing this at this point in time. Uh, the final two pathways uh, uh, um, have more of an eye appearance and not the dot. Uh, the bottom line, uh, it, uh, you know, in terms of angiography, I think it's important to recognize that there's an anomalous vessel, uh, but CTA really is now the gold standard to understand the, uh, the true course of these vessels. With respect to that second part of that question and asking, uh, you know, how do you assess a scheme related to the anomalous vessels? Uh, this too is very challenging, and especially when you uh, try to exercise individuals uh, and may not be getting a, a, an adequate heart rate response, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, the use of alternative means of assessment um, um, uh, with pressure-wise has been entertained, pressure gradient analysis by either FFR or IFR uh, 
uh, um, <clears throat> has been established for fixed lesions. Uh, this is not so for the dynamic obstruction that we see with the anomalous coronary vessel. And attempts to reproduce this dynamic obstruction has been studied uh, and reported in small series. And I will point out to the audience, they should look at the December 9, uh, 2019 issue of Jack Case Reports, where McCray and colleagues uh, um, uh, eloquently demonstrated how the use of dobutamine and atropine stimulated physical exertion and ischemia related to uh, dynamic uh, uh, um, obstruction. There have been other small studies uh, with the use of uh, volume challenging and dobutamine, and this is an algorithm that uh, uh, discusses that. Uh, but uh, this is this clearly needs to be more work done with the use of pressure wires to uh, understand where this should be used when we look for ischemia. And, and the final thing I would like to point out is, you know, how important is it really necessary, or how important is it to assess for ischemia in patients with the anomalous right coronary artery? Uh, at this year's ACC, uh, we presented an abstract comparing 96 patients with either an anomalous benign left circumflex coronary artery to those with an anomalous right coronary artery with an intraarterial uh, course. In these patients who were older than 35 years age, the average age was 57 years, there was no difference in mortality at follow-up at five and a half years, uh, which raises the questions, can these patients uh, be managed conservatively uh, without intervention? Thank you so much, uh, David. That's great points, uh, very interesting from your experience, you know, in the cath lab. Um, if I may ask uh, now Dr. Poirier, um, as a cardiothoracic surgeon, you know, uh, Dr. Poirier, it's um, important the clinical significance from your perspective as a surgeon in the older patient, and also from us as imagers, what would you like to know as a surgeon? So we would appreciate your point of view. Uh, you're muted, I think. Sorry. I can see you're muted. Apologies. Hello? Can you hear me? No, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. As was mentioned uh, just uh, by our previous uh, speaker, the older patients seem to be uh, a bit um, uh, protected uh, and, and seem to have a course that, re that is similar to a control population. I'm wondering if you could pull up the slides that I prepared. And so uh, there more and more of these patients that are going through uh, either through angiography, but especially through CT angiography, uh, we're seeing these patients coming in and we're having these diagnoses. Maybe the next slide, please. Yes, and so this is just one of, of many studies um, actually was published in the European Heart Journal in 2017 that uh, it is a matched cohort study uh, from Zurich. Uh, they uh, looked at all the CTs when there was uh, newly diagnosed uh, um, uh, coronary anomalies between 2003 and 2015. And they, they found 66 consecutive patients with different anomalies that are characterized in, in the table on the upper right. Um, and they compared those to 132 match controls. Now, the mean age was 56, which resembles what was mentioned uh, just previously, and uh, the follow-up was uh, on a mean of 48 uh, months. Now, they had the exact same um, uh, uh, annual uh, cardiac events uh, of 4.9% versus 4.8 for the controls. And if you look at the survival of the patients with the uh, coronary an uh, anomalies, it is similar to the controls, even if there was an interarterial course. So we're all saying the same thing uh, in that patients that are middle-aged uh, with these newly diagnosed uh, uh, anomalies, that they have pretty much the same midterm um, outcome as the uh, controls. Now, uh, we have to define uh, uh, middle-aged. Now, I see these patients just the same, and, and they want to go up Kilimanjaro, and they want to do this, and they want to do that. So they're, they're, we have this data, but it's extremely difficult to put it in perspective clinically when you have these patients that, in their mind, they're 23, and they're going up Kilimanjaro. Okay, so... So, but we, we do have a bit of data, and I think this is uh, we're going to be able to have more studies uh, coming and also be able to follow up these patients a little bit more and have a bit more data to have this discussion. Uh, as for uh, maybe we could go on to the next slide. 
I, I love the presentations on on the on the uh, imaging, and uh, I'll I'll be able to comment uh, on why the surgeon doesn't want to operate uh, your patient, Dr. Preston. So um, so first of all, in pre-oping these patients, we exercise test everyone so that we have a baseline because we're going to exercise test them afterwards. So at least we have some baseline. Yes, we want to show ischemia, but a left coming off a right uh, a coronary sinus is an indication for surgery. Um, we also do lipid testing because should we be giving them statins? Actually, are we treating them? We're basing our treatment post-op based on coronary uh, and, uh, acquired disease because there are no guidelines for this. And there are no guidelines for the follow-up either, other than the uh, three-month uh, uh, exercise testing. So, uh, naturally, I'm a congenital heart surgeon, so I want to look for other anomalies also. So, we'll be looking at the echo and the scan and MRI. Coronary angiogram is for the older patient, uh, or if there's a coronary uh, risks, or if you've done some kind of ischemia evaluation and it's in another territory. So I think that's worthwhile doing a, a pre-op coronary angiogram. Now, pre-op, uh, we do at the Montreal Heart Institute at our adult congenital group, uh, we uh, do CTA, uh, not only to define the uh, type of anomalous coronary and see if there is an indication, but also to look at the intramural length and course, as was mentioned by Dr. Preston. And you see here the images from the case report that was uh, presented. And also we want to see the relationship with the aortic valve. So next slide, please. Because the surgical interventions that we can offer for the coronaries that are coming from their opposite sinuses uh, uh, are, are uh, listed here, and it's very much about the aortic valve and also the course of the intramural uh, 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 trajectory. So the first uh, type is unroofing, and that's the, the most common uh, technique. And you see here, well, this is an image, this is the surgical image. So the left coronary is on the left, the right coronary is on the right, and we're through a sternotomy. We've, uh, we're on CPB and we've transected the aorta. So you see here with the unroofing, the uh, uh, intramural course is opened uh, with fine scissors. Actually, I put a st uh, I put an eight O uh, needle through the where I would think would be the end of the intramural course, and and that helps me uh, decide when to stop. Okay, so that we don't go. Uh, outside of the coronary artery and then get into trouble. And then we stitch it uh, so that uh, we don't have an uh, intimal flap. Now, if the course is uh, uh, not above the aortic uh, uh, commissure um, uh, the, between the left and the right uh, coronary cusp and that it goes below the, uh, the, the uh, commissure, then uh, if we bring down the commissure, we can we can have uh, AI afterwards, and that's well documented. So the other alternatives are uh, uh, shown here. This is an article from uh, Texas Heart Institute, and there's actually reimplantation. So you are either ligating the coronary sinus and putting the right coronary into the right coronary sinus, or uh, taking a button as shown. Uh, uh, here, uh, uh, where it says reimplantation, and it's placed into the right coronary sinus. Now, caveat: you, you have to know that uh, if you displace the right coronary, you also have to dissect onto the epicardium, and this can uh, cause uh, coronary trauma or just the vasovasorum or manipulation of the coronary artery can uh, can uh, possibly induce uh, um, uh, um, early atherosclerosis. So to keep in mind and that might be one of the reasons why your your surgeons wouldn't want to operate uh, your patient there if there need be uh, something like that anatomical repair this is the french that that uh, that uh, proposed that 
meaning that you leave things in situ. And once you've transected the aorta, you go down into the ostium and put in a patch, either saphenous vein or, or uh, autologous pericardium and uh, 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 make that origin big enough. And if you have a single coronary uh, giving off the left and the right with the right having an intramural course uh, and that you're symptomatic, it will just well, just move the pulmonary artery <laughs> as shown here uh, by the, the group from Stanford. So you transect the, the main uh, pulmonary trunk and you put it a little bit to the left and that should deal with the compression. Um, next slide, please. So the big question is how do we image these or follow these patients postoperatively? As I mentioned, our group there, we treat them as, as acquired coronary disease, so antiplatelet treatment and statins if it's uh, to well tolerated. But once more, we don't have any data for that. Exercise testing, as was mentioned in the uh, recommendations, especially if you're going to start up physical activity. Now, control, actually, we're going to go according to symptoms. So these patients, they really have to be taught about their symptoms and, and mention that they have to uh, consult if they do. And then imaging, there are no recommendations. I personally and our group, we do do an MRI because we're not looking for that spatial resolution of the CT, trying to reduce the uh, um, radiation. So an MRI at least before uh, or around a, a discharge and then only redone if uh, uh, need be, if we show ischemia. Thanks, you. Thank you, Nancy. That was great. Uh, inter non -in non invasive cardiologists and all cardiologists in general always love seeing surgical talks and, and trying to correlate what they see with the anatomy and what you do to fix it. Uh, just before we close, I want to throw out uh, a, a just a comment or, or maybe perhaps stimulate something because what we kept on hearing is we need more data. We need more data. We don't know. Some of the studies now are starting to show perhaps equivalence between invasive uh, be between intervention and, and conservative management. So in North America, we're quite a, quite a ways behind uh, the people at uh, guys in uh, guys in St. Thomas, and you have the words NHS trust in there and King's College, uh, where NHS recommends CT as the initial evaluation for uh, for chest pain uh, as opposed to stress testing, SPECT, uh, etc. So you must be doing 100,000 CTs a year, and if the prevalence is one percent, or, or the, sorry, the in, uh, the prevalence is one percent, you should be acquiring a lot of people with anomalous coronaries. Then you have your UK biobank study with hundreds of thousands of patients that have all that strong uh, demographic data. So this should be a rich uh, database and pool of information for you to perhaps address some of the questions. Granted, it's registry data, but perhaps a first step to designing something uh, uh, prospective. So I want to thank all the the speakers uh, and the, the the speakers on the panelists. A great case uh, that uh, stimulated a lot of discussion. I'm sure that. Uh, the older people who are still not old, uh, of which I include myself, uh, really appreciate the fact that we have all these non-invasive tools right now. Uh, so we don't have to try and figure out in the cath lab uh, uh, what the course is. We we can say this looks funny and let's get alternate imaging. Of course, we want to try and answer it ourselves. But uh, really, we see the 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 strong interplay between the diagnosis the prognostication based on non-invasive imaging and how we can help guide uh, Dr. Parye and her colleagues in, in terms of how, how to repair uh, instead of trying to figure it out once you get in there. So uh, I just want to thank also the, the panel, the audience uh, for their questions um, and for all the organizers from the ACC. Uh, this is a regular thing that we do every two or three months and we would appreciate feedback. Uh, and this talk was recorded and will be on the ACC webpage. Uh, sometime next week. Uh, so thank you again for everybody for your participation uh, and please stay safe uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.